So in this short video, we can look at some of the key elements of part A of unit three, which is planning a scientific investigation. I'm gonna to cover today developing a hypothesis for an investigation. These we've covered loads of times with your um, assignments. And I'm gonna cover variables in investigation and the method for data collection analysis and give you an opportunity to have a go at each of these. So the first one is developing a hypothesis for an investigation. So the first thing is developing a hypothesis for investigation. So you need to be able to formulate a hypothesis or a null hypothesis based on relative scientific ideas. So what's a hypothesis? Well, it's a prediction based on scientific ideas as a starting point for an investigation. For example, suppose you had been asked to plan an investigation to study the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction between magnesium ribbon and hydrochloric acid. What would be your hypothesis for this investigation? Don't forget to base it on science, which is the collision theory from GCSE. Pause the video, have a think what you'd say, and then I'll go. So I would say, as the temperature increases, the rate of reaction would increase, and therefore the magnesium ribbon would disappear faster. But why would be the science? This is because magnesium atoms must collide with the hydrochloric acid molecules and have enough energy in the collisions, which remember was activation energy, for them to react. So as you increase the temperature of the hydrochloric acid molecules, they move faster, which means the frequency of collisions is greater and the energy in the collisions is also greater. This increases the rate of reaction. So that's an example of a hypothesis. So what's a null hypothesis? Well, a null hypothesis is a prediction that states there's no relationship between two variables or difference between different groups. And so what you have to do is to try and prove that there is a difference by rejecting that. So for an example, I predict there'll be no difference between the population of daisies found at the back of the science block compared with the population of daisies behind the mass block. And that would be a null hypothesis. Now, we would use t-tests or chi-squared tests to either accept the hypothesis or reject it to see whether there is actually a significant difference or not and we'll cover that at a later stage. So the next part is selection of appropriate equipment, techniques and standard procedures. Let me just remind you of a few so you get a flavour of it. Of course using a balance to two decimal places, 0.0 grams, tearing it and leveling it first and also calibrating it would be a standard procedure. Measuring accurate volumes using a graduated pipette. Stirring liquids being heated and keep the thermometer away from the edges of the container. Measuring temperatures and volumes of liquids in measuring cylinders at eye level to eliminate parallax error. So what about health and safety? Well, you need to say how to reduce the risk of using chemicals like acids, alkalized enzymes and flammable hydrocarbons. You need to know that two molar concentration of acids and alkalis is the maximum you can use. So this, of course, would govern the range of con concentrations that you can do. Now, you've got to make sure that in any practical investigation, you have at least five different values, and I would suggest seven to eight, and at the biggest range. So, of course, your maximum range for acids will be two molar. So you could do those values up to two molar. How do you reduce the risk when heating liquids? How do you reduce the risk in equipment in electrical experiments? All of these things we'll look at as we do each of the topics. So the next thing is, what are independent, dependent or controlled variables? The independent variable is the one that you are changing. The dependent variable is the one that may change when you change the dependent variable. So this is the one you measure. The dependent variable depends on the independent variable. And finally, the control variables are factors which would also affect your dependent variable. So you must keep these the same. So if there is a change in your dependent variable, you know it's because of the independent variable that you are testing, not affected by the other variables that you are controlling. What I want to do is to have a go at these. So pause the video and work out what you think the independent, dependent and control variables are 
for this investigation. Then I'll go through. So of course your independent variable is the temperature, your dependent variable is the time for reactions to take place, and your control variables are the following. Concentration of acid will affect how fast it reacts. The length of magnesium ribbon will affect how fast it reacts. And of course the volume of acid is also important. You could have said the mass of ribbon and also the surface area as well. Have a go at this one, and I'll go through it in a minute. So the current is your independent variable. The number of paper clips picked up depends on the current. And the little strength electromagnet is also changed by the number of turns and iron core. Of course, if you change the size of your paper clips, then you'll be able then you'll pick up less than you did previously. So that's another variable you have to keep it safe. So I hope that's given you an idea of independent, dependent, and control variables. So the last one I want to have a go at in a minute is to plan a method for collecting and analysizing data as you would in the question four in your exam. So you need to be able to produce a clear, logical, ordered method to obtain results. You need to be able to select relevant measurements and a range of measurements to be recorded. Remember, you need a minimum of five values and you want as wide a range as possible. You need to understand the importance of collecting accurate and reliable data to appropriate levels of precision. You need to understand how the variables can be controlled, measured or monitored. And you need to understand how the data might be analysed. So have a practice with this example. Hydrochloric acid reacts with magnesium to produce hydrogen gas. The equation of the reaction is magnesium plus hydrochloric acid goes to magnesium chloride and hydrogen. You've been provided with different concentrations of hydrochloric acid and magnesium ribbon. You are to plan an investigation into how changing the concentration of the hydrochloric acid affects the rate of reaction between the hydrochloric acid and magnesium. Your plan should include a hypothesis, remember to base it on scientific theory, a selection and justification of equipment you are going to use any hazards and risks associated with the investigation and how to reduce them, what's the independent variable, the dependent variable and the control variables, and a method for data collection to test the hypothesis, including the quantities to be measured, the number and range of measurements to be taken and how the apparatus may be used. This will be worth 12 marks in question four on your exam. So have a go at that. Pause the video, write it down, and I'll go through the answers in a minute. So this is how I'd set out the answer. I would have hypotheses, variables, method, and health and safety. And of course, you'll get more used to this as you do lots of examples uh, during the next term. So also the 12 marks you don't have to hit every single point. So the 12 marks means that you've done reasonably well on all the different areas. So my hypothesis would be, as the concentration of acid increases, the time taken for the magnesium to react will decrease, so the rate of reaction will increase. In science, this is because a higher concentration contains more molecules of acid. This means there'll be more collisions per second between the acid molecules and the magnesium so increasing the rate of reaction. So what about my variables? The independent variable is the concentration of acid. The dependent variable is the time for the magnesium to react. It depends on the concentration. What else affects how quickly the magnesium reacts? Well, these will be my control variables, which are the volume of acid. And I'm putting the volumes in here, so 20 milliliters, the temperature of the acid, I'm saying it's going to be room temperature, the length of room, I'm setting it at 10 millimeters. So it's really clear how I'm controlling those variables. So what about my method? I'm going to bullet point a method. So the first thing I'm going to do is to measure out 20 milliliters of 0.25 molar hydrochloric acid using a small measuring cylinder. And I've set the precision as well to 0.2 milliliters. And I've also said ensuring you're measuring at eye level to eliminate parallax 
So in that one sentence, I've got a huge amount of information. You don't have to have set 20 millimeters. You could have said 30, 40, 60. It is up to you, but just make it clear what you're using. I've then said I'm going to cut a 10 millimeter strip of my prism ribbon, measuring it carefully with a ruler. I've said precise to one millimeter. I'm going to add the magnesium ribbon to the acid and start the stopwatch again straight away in brackets. I put precision is 0.01 seconds. So I'm including that as I go along rather than writing it all out separately. I'm going to stop the stopwatch when all the magnesium ribbon has reacted. I'm then going to say that I'm going to repeat that result for 0.25 moles two more times, looking for any anonymous results and eliminating them and adding extra repeats if needed. So finally, all I've got to say now is I've got to now repeat the whole thing for different values of concentrations, making sure I've got a range of concentrations and at least five other values. So I've just said, repeat the above procedure for the following concentrations. Notice I'm not using over two moles. Finally, health and safety. It doesn't have to be in a lot of detail. They're looking that you understand some basic things. So, wear goggles. Why? To prevent acid getting in your eyes. Wash hands thoroughly if acid is in contact with the skin. Stand up when doing practical work in case uh, it spills. So, those are really all you'd have to do to cover health and safety. And that would get you easily 12 marks. So I'm hoping that that gives you a bit of encouragement that that's actually not too tricky. And you'll learn the decisions for different equipment as we go through, and you'll have already done all the practicals that they want you to plan.